All right, welcome. Glad to be here, I'm Michael Ma, and I am really excited because this is a part of a continuation of a story. Uh, I was asked to be the first keynote speaker at the Koha Conference, Path to Agility, years ago, and Ken Schwaber was the other keynote speaker, and the reason why I was invited was because for five, eight years up until that point, I'd been known on the lecture circuit as being someone that's reporting about what we're seeing in Agile patterns, okay? Uh, uh, are cycle times really shortening? Are we seeing bug rates drop? Is this successful, this recreation and re-engineering of the social ecosystem, is it giving us results? So Bart asked if I would talk about that, and now, years later, the story continues to unfold. So a little bit about uh, uh, the history of this. Um, I'm a partner in a firm called Quantitative Software Management Associates, QSM Associates, and we have the world's largest database of historical project statistics. It's like the Kelly Blue Book of software projects. I'm also the benchmark project uh, director at the Cutter Consortium, a think tank outside of Boston, and we publish uh, research on what we're seeing in software patterns. There's also an agile practice that was headed up at one point by Jim Highsmith, who's authored a number of agile books, and uh, he was one of the original signers of the Agile Manifesto. We used to have great fun by talking about whether we really needed to get measurements in Agile, or is measurement something that's more uh, outside of Agile, and we had these great debates. Ultimately, we realized that when we bring the two together, we can really talk substantively about people uh, about teams for people who are stakeholders and decide how to implement this, get buy-in. So uh, that's a little bit of the background. Right now the research continues to grow and I'm going to show you some really exciting patterns. Now when I'm not talking about software, I fly airplanes. Uh, this is my little Piper Cherokee. I live in the mountains of western Massachusetts and there's no software in this. In fact, it's steam gauges, you know, sometimes just fly by visual rules, no glass panels, no nothing. Uh, it gets even more interesting when you're in short fields coming in and it's all visual and you're flying by the seat of your pants. Uh, this is another nice little plane, very minimalist in design. Uh, and I get an appreciation for navigation, particularly in aviation, because I started on navigation in nuclear submarines, where there are no windows and you can't see, and it's all software. And this is the control panel for the uh, first officer, the people who navigate the ship. And there's an incredible amount of code in this. And I was the test director uh, doing test-driven development years ago to design software for nuclear submarines. Now, why did we do that? We wanted really clean code. Because if you have bugs in code that steers a nuclear submarine with 24 missiles on board. That's a bad thing. Okay, so uh, this is a Trident II ballistic missile submarine in dry dock in Groton, Connecticut, and our navigation system sat right in there. I found out that what we were doing uh, predated Agile, but it was uh, consistent with some of the attributes that we think about. Writing tests before we write code, pairing programmers, co-locating everybody in a large room, and back then, we started collecting patterns on how our projects behaved. And that's really kind of how I got the idea about you know, being able to convey what we're seeing. So over the last 10 years, I've actually been on the lecture circuit talking about what we've been seeing in Agile patterns at conferences in the United States and overseas in Europe. And it's getting pretty exciting because the numbers are starting to light up. So that brings us to Columbus. A while back, while Ben Blancara and I were having sushi in a restaurant in Dublin. We'll call it like the Sushi Manifesto, right? We said, hey, we think something special is going on here in Columbus. What if we collected velocity data, headcount data, cycle time data, bug data, and took a look? And so let's think about a Columbus versus the world agile study. And that happened a couple of years ago. And a number of people, brave souls, decided they would join in and be part of this community that would collect up some numbers and see what we find. So bottom line is we compared it against our worldwide database. Uh, we had a number of uh, uh, bins in the database that we separated. So we put the avionics system separate from the 
military system, separate from the process control, separate from telecom, separate from business IT. And we looked at the business IT systems and compared the Columbus data against that sector of our database. And we wanted to know whether or not we're going to find that the Columbus community was uh, really neck and neck, head to head against other companies in the database. And there are a lot of folks in the database that are blue chip firms where uh, software is extremely strategic and uh, becoming increasingly more important to competitiveness. So this is kind of a sample of the family of names that are in our research database. So we were looking to see whether Kent Beck's hypothesis was true. If Agile is successful, it should be that we are delivering more functionality in a shorter time with fewer bugs. Now that's one criteria of success. Someone might say, well, we also want to be able to ensure that we're deliver, delivering value in those releases that we're meeting our target dates with clean code. So we started looking at these, uh, this data, and here's what we found. We found that the Columbus companies, dozen and a half or so projects, were building software at least 30% faster uh, than the industry norm. Okay, so what takes 10 months out there, teams in Columbus are doing in seven. But the real sticker kicker was the bug rates, down by a factor of four. So for every 100 bugs that were found and experienced and fixed during system tests, there were 25 among the companies that were in the Agile study here in Columbus. And some of you are actually participants who contributed data to the study. It's been published several times in press releases out on the web. And if you want a copy of the PDF for this report, just give me a card and I'll send you the URL and you can download it. It gives a little bit more detail on the, on the, on the data itself. So then I thought, well, I've been asked to give the keynote speech at the uh, OOP conference in Munich, Germany. And uh, the conference chair said, well, what would you like to talk about? And I said, how about I give a talk about what US data is showing in terms of productivity patterns uh, in Agile? And they said, great. And this is the, uh, the conference. It's, uh, well, Munich, Germany is absolutely beautiful. There's an incredibly burgeoning, emerging uh, Agile culture there. Uh, this is the uh, uh, conference center where the event is held. About 1,000 people come through the expo and the sessions. Uh, beautiful layout, draws uh, folks mostly from Germany, but also from other areas around uh, Central Europe. And so here was the talk. This is Herr Gunther Vormeister, who is the, the chair of the conference, introducing me. And the talk was, Agile redefines economics, what recent benchmark data is uh, showing, reveal, what data is, US data is revealing uh, on recent benchmark research in Agile. And it was great fun because the place was packed. It was about 750 to 1,000 folks in the room. And so um, I was talking about what we're seeing primarily from data in the United States, but I focused also on the Columbus research study because this was really uh, setting a different bar of performance that we're seeing from the data. So we're talking about how do we find the truth about whether Agile is working in an organization uh, that uh, is implementing it. And I told them that what we did was we collected this, the data in a very consistent manner that goes into our QSM SLIM, Software Lifecycle Management Research Database. And then we can actually visually graph these patterns against trends for schedule, cycle time, for effort, staffing, and bug rates. And I talked about are we going to really see the results from really what I think is a social reorganization of how we interact. It's really creating a different ecosystem within which we're solving technical problems and building code. And it looks like this. It looks like people collaborating, working together, open spaces. Uh, this happens to be a case study that has been a poster child of what I've seen for agile performance for quite a number of years. I published this company and another firm in a report that said uh, it was entitled How Agile Projects Measure Up and What This Means to You. If you want to download a copy of it, in your bag you have a white card with a URL and you can get uh, a download of this particular organization. This happens to be a company called Follett Software in 
McHenry, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. And it looks like this. It looks like people working in a space that's quite different from what we're used to. And your spaces probably mimic uh, this kind of scene. Highly social, pretty noisy, very open, pair programmers, kind of messy. Uh, does this work? Is this the way we should be building and collaborating on highly complex technological solutions? And I think the answer is yes. It seems as though the energy, the feel, uh, the fun factor, uh, especially makes itself known in co-location, okay? Because the contrast to this is chop development all up, split it all over the planet, all right? Outsource it, offshore it, you know, chop it into bits, put it all together. And I've published a number of papers that talk about the contrast between the two. But we want to see about what's happening in this kind of scenario. Right? Does a ping pong table help? Right? Is that something that is uh, about refreshing the mind and keeping us sharp? So here's the bottom line for this particular firm. Their CEO wanted to know the numbers because their executive committee, CEO, CIO, CFO, was making a decision. Do we go this way? Do we stay this way? Do we expand on this? Or do we just do more of the work offshore? And this is what we found. We found that for an industry average uh, cost, schedule, defects, staffing, this is representative of what would be typical for the kinds of systems that this company built. Their performance, instead of 3.5 million, they were building a system for 2.2 million or 1.3 million less five months faster, with half the bugs, and the same size team. This one chart is something that people often ask. If we did a throwdown, side by side, our company against industry, what would we see? And so we said, you know what? This is remarkable because Agile captures exactly the right metrics that we need to do this kind of analysis. Right? It goes right into our SLIM model. We're looking at velocity. We add up all the story points stories, the working software that actually implements those stories and story points, the end-to-end -end schedule, the headcount, the bug rates. All right, pop that right in. And we can get it even from a sketch. So this is a Follett software diagram where we said, OK, the story work is happening with a couple of people over five minutes right here. The uh, sprint one starts here. We have 14 sprints that go right to here. We've got 252 story points that are delivered. During this period of time in QA, we found a certain number of bugs, had some action items to get that number precisely, and we tally it all up. We drop it into a data record in our database, and then we do the comparison. And when we do that for one release, two, three, four, five, six releases, we want to answer the question, when they finish this in six months, is that slower than average compared to industry? Is it faster? When they staff with 20, 25 people, is that more people or is that fewer people? If they found 121 bugs during final QA before first customer ship, is that more bugs? Is that fewer bugs? And so this is what we do with one, two, four, six releases. You plot it up on a chart. This is schedule for the 14 sprints, all right? So this release right here was, six, was about six... Uh, six and a half months or six months, we wanted to know how does this compare against the QSM research data where that center line is the industry average. And we find that they build in six months what the industry takes 10 months to do. All right? This release is even faster. It's got more stories, more functionality, and it's uh, on this point in the schedule line, also about five months perhaps, six months. And that's the industry average, 7.5, 7.0, 8.0, 6.5 release. We draw a line right through that. And we can see that the red line is consistently lower than the black line. And the bottom line is their schedules are five months faster compared to industry when the industry average is 12 months. They do in seven months, eight months, what the industry takes 12, 13 months altogether, end to end. This is bug rates. So when we find and fix a certain amount of bugs in the code during testing, is that more or fewer? And consistently, it's fewer. And it's by about 40, 50% fewer bugs. And then we realize that because the code is being written clean by pair programmers co-located, they have to spend less time testing. 
and they're ready to ship sooner. And so Jim Highsmith and I say this is a validation of our hypothesis that the way we're getting cycle time reduction in Agile is that we're building it clean and we get schedule. It used to be in the old days that we would throw lots of people on a project to try to brute force a thing to get the schedule in and hope we can test it in time to get it out the door. But now we've turned it upside down. So what we're essentially doing is taking what is a defect curve like this, where bugs typically rise to a peak and then tail down during our last phase of testing, we want to get all the bugs out, and we're shrinking it. We're collapsing it. Right? It's not blowing up. And think about this. If you take large numbers of people and you throw bodies on a project and it's this giant waterfall kind of approach and there are also folks all over the globe in different time zones, does it tend to be that this curve actually gets smaller or does it get larger? It gets larger. And we found from research that when you split teams and have all of that communication difficulty from a lack of co-location, the bug rates increase by two to three times. And it's more like two 2.8 times industry average. So now think about this. Let's say for every 100 bugs, that's the industry norm, and you do it that way, and you have 280 bugs in the code to find and fix, versus doing it in the agile way, co-located teams pair programmers, and you have 50. The end-to-end -end difference is like 50 to 280. That's a whole lot of difference in testing, because right? you're building it right the first time. So Kent Beck. You're right. If Agile is successful, at least in these two domains, we should be short, seeing shorter cycle times and fewer defects. And then we get to our study. We get to Columbus versus the world, where we had a bunch of companies contribute data, and we look at it uh, as a group. So that's what we did a couple of years ago. And this is the 1.0 study. And then we said, OK, this is what we've got, Germany. What you guys got? You know, it was kind of fun. I said. This is Columbus, Ohio. Let's do a throwdown. All right, where would data in Germany look like compared to Columbus, Ohio? And I didn't know this, but I kind of threw it out as a whimsical joke. But they took me seriously. And they said, the Germans are good engineers, and we beat the Americans. You know, I mean, they really got into this competitive throwdown thing. And I was just being kind of funny, because that's all I do when I'm home. I watch Bobby Flay, and it's like, this is a Food Network throwdown, right? So I was like, what you got? Right? So here's what we got when we uh, talk about Germany, Munich versus Columbus. Right? Now, the information that we collect, again, I'll repeat, it's typical stuff that we collect anyway in Agile. We're looking at, say, the duration end to end, the head count, four, you know, over four months, 10 folks, building this many stories, this many story points, and to implement that, this is the working software that implements those stories and story points. And when we test it, we found 45 bugs during QA testing. If you can get information like that, you can join the 2.0 study, because we're going to do another round of this and then go back to Germany next year. Okay. All right, so this is the answer to life to everything. I've shown some of these slides in the past, but now I'm going to overlay the Munich, Germany data. Okay, so this was speed for the Columbus data. And from small, medium, large projects plotted against this curve, where this is the industry average schedule, all right, here's how the Columbus data reads. Now, you too can be a highly paid software metrics benchmarking analysts, count the dots. How many dots are below, below the line? How many are above? You can see it. It's like a constellation and an equator. Right? More of the dots are below, below the line. Right? And if we draw a line right through that for a regression fit, we can see that this is the 30% schedule. So what's in 10 months is the industry average. That's about 7. What's in 6 months here is about 4, so on and so forth. And this is the Columbus data. Now let's go to the German data. What do you see? All right? What do you see? Count the dots. Come on. <laughs> Work your billable hours. Earn your money. How many dots are below the line? How many are above? Right? It's kind of split. Is this an SAP project? <laughs> this is an SAP project. Uh, this was a, a whole mix of different kinds of projects, but I don't think SAP was in there. Where do we add that? <laughs> now we throw the line there, 
And we have an interesting pattern, right? Okay, right at about this point, we could say that the data is, the, these projects are faster than the QSM average, but these projects are longer. So, smaller releases tend to be faster in the German world. Larger releases tend to take longer, right? And this is the data side by side. And these are the trend lines side by side. So is the red above? On the right side, uh, USA green, Germany red. Who wins? Throw down. USA. 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 <laughs> I'm going to create an international incident. I can just, <laughs> I can just tell. All right. All right, so that's schedule. Bugs. Life. That's the Columbus data. This is the statistic that said that the bugs are 75% fewer for the Columbus community compared to the QSM industry norms. And when we draw a line right through this, this is what we're talking about. Now, interestingly, as the systems grow from small, medium, large, going left to right, you see the gap narrowing or widening? And widening. That means that even, especially on the larger systems, we're seeing bug rates lower than even on smaller systems, all right? And this is why we're able to hit our delivery dates. We're done testing. Ready. Ship it. It works, okay? Here is the German data. Kind of with these two outliers aside, it's kind of like right in the lane, right? Now. If we count the dots and be a highly paid metrics consultant, we can say two, four, six out of these nine are below the average. So two out of three are fewer defects than the QSM industry average. Right? These two seem to be really remarkable outliers. We'd want to double check that. But here's how we draw the line. Okay? Uh, if I omit these two data points, it's probably kind of more parallel, but still below the industry average. But this is the mix of the Columbus and Munich. What do you see? Let's overlay the lines. What do you see? Which line is lower, the green line or the red line? Green line. So everything above something that might be seven, eight, ten thousand lines of code, the green line stays way in the lead and has far fewer bugs in the code than, say, the red line. Who wins? Germany, USA. USA, USA. So, so far we got schedule, we got bugs, right? Staffing. Do we tend to use smaller or larger teams? This is the Columbus data. What do you see? What do you see? You see this pocket here being larger teams, right? Like this constellation, it doesn't quite look like the Big Dipper or Orion's belt, but this cluster of projects is riding up on the upper trend line, which is like the upper standard deviation, okay? So this is the average. So larger teams, there's this upper line. But the rest of the data is kind of like right around the middle, right? But yet because of that cluster of larger teams on the smaller bucket, in the t-shirt sizing bucket, the trend line looks like this. So you could say that generally, for the most part, we tend to use larger teams. Why would we tend to do that, do you think, in our American culture? Why would we tend to put more staff resources on a project, we think? Get it done faster. Get it done faster. Okay, so we're looking for that time to market, and we saw that, right? We saw like the schedules 30, 40% faster, and we use a larger team, and we're willing to pay the price for that. This is the German data, interestingly. How many are below? The majority of them are below, right? One, two, four, six, eight, nine out of 12. Three quarters of the data points use smaller teams than the norm. Now, I'll tell you, this is actually uh, a kind of conservative view of this because I had to exclude project teams that were three people or fewer. So there's even more dots that actually were lower, but I didn't think that they should be in the study because I didn't think that that was really a team, like a team of two people for an entire release. It's really a pair. It's not really, it's almost a team, you know, but for the same criteria, I said three people or more, let's compare the data, and this is the German data. So the Germans actually seem to be dipping their toe in the water a little bit more gently, 
right? They're not really committing yet. And that's what we're seeing. That's what I get a sense of when I'm over in Europe. They're like, let's see what the Americans do first, you know? Um, and it doesn't seem to be having as rapid a, as an adoption. I mean, Agile really came, it was started here in the United States, Salt Lake City. Well, uh, it's, it's really an American innovation. And it's almost a way of reclaiming the software industry. Think about it. Like before that, we're thinking inexpensive programmers just ship, it, ship software work around the world. And we saw our entire like, you know, economy just kind of almost collapse. And there was a rise of India. And the gross domestic product of India, like a trillion dollars a year, is really attributable to software engineering. Well, good for them. Brilliant, smart people do exist all over the world. Okay, but we really found a whole migration outward, and now it's coming back. So now it's coming back. So does this support the whole concept of rise and resurrection of the American programmer? Rise and resurrection of the American programmer. You tell me, right? Right? Let's take a look. So this is smaller teams in the German data, and then we put the uh, data on staffing side by side, and we tend to see that the Germans tend to use smaller teams. Red line is below the green line, okay? And um, when we look at total effort, I think we'll see the next few graphs, effort and cost. This is the U.S. data. It's kind of split above and below, all right? Now, even though we use larger teams, it's mostly on the smaller side. The effort in terms of person hours, person months, tends to be on the lower end. So not only are we getting fast schedules, low bugs, but we're also spending fewer uh, effort hours and costs. And then we put the line through that. And then we put the German data up. We put the line through that. And we put it together. And it's kind of like the Germans have us on effort for anything below 75,000 lines of code. All right, so kind of who wins here in terms of effort and spend? I'd say Germany by about two-thirds, OK? So, so far, we got two to one, right? There we go. A throwdown. Germany, you've been chopped. <laughs> Why does this work? Why does this work? And I've, I've written about this before, so some of you who have seen my talks before might see this again. It's familiar. I think that it's really about concentrating learning in a space where that magic and that energy happens when people are close together, right? There's an, a remarkable amount of cycle time and reliability communication when we have short feedback loops, right? That's one. High bandwidth communication, information is flowing. It's not being choked through emails that are crossing time zones. We're moving information quickly. Transparency. I love this quote. I stole it from Ken. He said this in the first keynote in the conference here, X number of year, four years ago. He said, transparency is a great floodlight. People who thrive in political maneuvering hate scrum. And that's true. I think the visibility and transparency, one open space, everything's out in the open, something pops up as a problem, it gets fixed pretty quickly. And finally, with Follett Software, they said, you know what? People are burning out, and a tired mind isn't a creative mind. And would you agree that's true? I mean, I get my best ideas at 7 in the morning when I'm working out in the gym before I go to, go to work. I take a piece of paper, I'll stick it in my pocket with a little stubby pencil, and I'm working out, or I'm on the tennis court, or I'm doing you know, something on the machines, and suddenly I find my brain is firing. You know? Stuff is popping up, and I've got all kinds of great things that I didn't take into work. It's a great trick, so any of you who want to you know, find a way of tapping that stuff that's in the part of the mind that we don't usually access very easily, that's a good trick. And a tired mind just doesn't cut it. It doesn't work. So I do think that if we burn out knowledge workers, we're just going to get crappy knowledge. And Follett said, you have to go home. We want you to not work overtime. I mean, think about that if your managers and bosses said, don't work overtime. But that's what this culture did. Talk about cultural change. And Follett is an educational software company. They're like the Amazon.com of educational materials for schools K through 12. And so they're about children and education. And they said to their employees, we want you to go home to do homework with your kids and have dinner with your families. No 12-hour, 16-hour workdays, all right? And they lived that cultural value, and it came out in their performance. So what? What matters? What really matters? 
All right, so we're good at building code. We build it fast. We build it well. What would we do with it? Maybe you're in the medical systems delivery and your software saves lives. All right, I had a programmer at uh, a company called BD, Becton Dickinson, and they built code that was about finding infection in uh, blood, uh, blood samples, all right? So this is, uh, this is septicemia, and if you get a bacterial viral infection in your bloodstream, if you don't attack it immediately, you got about 24 hours before you go in a pine box, okay? So this programmer was telling me the story that he was writing this code, and this was what it was for, and they really were passionate about that they wrote software that saved lives. Fast forward six, eight months later, he wound up being rushed to the emergency room, and he was incredibly sick. And the code he wrote found a septicemia infection in his blood and saved his own life. That was freaky, all right? So maybe you write code that's about preserving life. Maybe you write code that's about trying to deal with the strain on the planet. Maybe you write code that's about dealing with climate change, all right? And he's trying to reduce emissions. Uh, and try to prevent what's going on here in the long-term trend. Maybe you write code that's about the energy, about tapping uh, wind and solar or something like that, as opposed to the way we used to do it. Hopefully we don't have to do it too long. Maybe you write code to educate the world's children. Seven billion people on the planet now, three billion when I was born. We're going to like eight, nine billion. And our kids, I imagine a lot of you also have families in this room, probably going to have to solve problems that we never really imagined in our generation, right? Maybe they're going to be the digitals in the next generation that can solve stuff that we created, all right? So we have to educate them. Maybe we're going to deal with the strain from going to three, four, five, seven, eight billion in the future. What's technology going to do, right? So this is the larger noble purpose I think about when I say, wow, engineers, software designers, this is like noble work, you know? And it's even noble work for when you're just moving information and moving products around the planet and, and, and keeping all of the flow of humanity going. Maybe you're dealing with the fact that fuel is going up like crazy. This is Oslo, Norway. I took a picture of this gas pump, and it's basically $11 a gallon. We complain when we get to 375 and 4 bucks, all right? The Europeans are seeing 9 10 $12 a gallon. In Switzerland, I offered to fill up a friend's tank, and he said, no, no, you don't have to do that. And I said, come on, you're driving me from Munich, Germany. You're taking me skiing in the Alps after the conference. I'll buy your gas. No, no, you don't have to do that. So he says, OK, OK. You know, this is Andrea Jelly, the, my Swiss-German partner. And so he fills up the tank. It's a little Mercedes station wagon that's got our skis in it. And it's 125 bucks. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, <laughs> I put my visa in. And they don't think a thing of it, right? which is interesting. Maybe you want to spend more time with your families. Maybe you don't want to burn out. Maybe you want to do good work and be happy and raise your kids. So wait, there's more as we wrap up. And I'm actually, wow, am I moving or what? Talk about like agile. There's more. The 1.0 study against the Germans, right? Columbus study 1.0 just cleaned them out, <laughs> you know? I'm going to go back to Germany, and Herr Gunther Formeister is going to invite me back. And I'm like, Gunther, I got some tough news for your audience to swallow at the next keynote, right? But hey, I get to go over there and I'll ski afterwards again, right? But I think that we should move it forward. Let's go. Let's do a 2.0 study. There are folks in Chicago who've heard about this. Germany, uh, Columbus, Ohio. Like, what about, what about Chicago? Boston, I'll be speaking there in the fall. What about Boston? I mean, we could really create an international incident here, right? Let's have like the Agile Olympics. But let's maybe start with a 2.0 Columbus study if any of you folks are into it. So what about you? If anybody wants to test this out, this is what we're maybe looking at the next 6, 8, 12 months. Are you curious? How would you stack up against these Agile trend lines, which we now can produce for schedule, for effort hours, for team size, for bugs? And the thing about it is it's private and confidential. So when we get a bunch of data, a bunch of green dots, nobody knows whose dots is whose. 
right? In the first study, people said, I don't know if I want to hang my dirty laundry out there because I don't think that we're that great. I'm like, okay, well, nobody knows who your green dots are. And in a private web viewing, we'll just light yours up as blue. And only you get to see which your three dots are against the 12 that are the rest of the gang. And you win both ways, I think. If you find something that's kind of latent and stinky and you got some problems there, you really want to spotlight it and fix it quickly, right? Uh, but if it's really great, you also want to be able to communicate that to your stakeholders if you're looking at keeping the agile momentum going because it won't go forever and a lot of times it slows down and sometimes even turns around and people come back in and management changes and they say, ah, we don't believe in this agile smagile stuff. So I think that if, uh, if you're curious, George, uh, we're going to do you know, like a show me the monkey of the next 2.0 study. So, uh, ask me any questions about this if you're interested, and I'll give you a feel for how it's done and uh, what the mechanics are of it. So with that, uh, that's it. That's the story. And I hope that uh, you found this really interesting, because I did. I remember when the data was first lighting up, I was like, wow, this is so cool. And uh, this is, you get to see it for the first time. So this audience is the first. And with that, we're done with the main part. We have all kinds of time to just talk and ask questions. And, sir. Uh, in the benchmark and everything you have there, uh, do you foresee any of the rise in the dynamic languages and dynamic uh, language uh, frameworks skewing or changing the numbers in any way? Not yet. Not yet. I mean, we're, we're really seeing that a lot of this work, you know, Java, XML, uh, you know, C sharp, you know, typical environments that we're seeing now. And questions like that, the question was, are we seeing anything kind of shifting the data from some of the new dynamic language environments? That's always what we're going to keep an eye out for. Uh, when we pub published some of the observations about the defect patterns, I remember asking, you know, one of the gentlemen in this audience. I said, hey, when you can, can you tell me what is it that are some of the main attributes that you're seeing from the data that you contributed to the study? And he said, we were really focusing a lot on acceptance test-driven development. And as we were doing that more, we were finding that it was really successful in our environment. And that's probably, a, you know, no doubt, a driving factor in why our code was so clean. Um, test automation in some of the data that's in here. People say, why do we have to write all of this automation test code? That's not delivered to the customer. Like we're finding that we're writing like 30% automation test code for the 70% that's the working code for the stories. And we said, well, that's what makes the code so po possible to be clean for the 70% that you're delivering. And then it's a reusable asset. And so in the next release, when you have this automated test code, that's stuff that you can reuse and then you're not doing as much manual testing. All right, so that also has a payback in terms of reducing the effort and shortening the schedules. And so those, that was one type of attribute that came back from the 1.0 Columbus study. Good question. This is where inquiring minds want to know, right? I'm going to say, what's going on behind the dots, right? What are the factors that are positive impacts, factors that were negative impacts, you know? Dustin. So Michael, uh, in Germany, what kind of practices did you see them embrace the most versus in Columbus? So from a, an right. agile to agile comparison. Yeah. Um, the, the question is, what were some of the German practices that they were adopting in agile? I really saw that at this stage, it's, it's in its uh, infancy. It's, it's new. So they're kind of dipping their toe in the water. I don't see like the full out, we're going to completely retool the entire room. We're going to completely rip out the cubicles and we're going to have co-located and pair teams. And when Follett Software said, we want you to go home at night, all right, they said, you must put photos of your children under your monitors to remind you about why you're working here and you go home. Like that kind of cultural change I didn't see in Germany. Um, we're seeing like more of a, 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 a scratch the surface of the water on adopting Scrum, right? So building things in short iterations, uh, looking at sizing things in stories and story points, 
right? Doing some release planning at that level and doing iteration by iteration planning, sort of. But at the same time, the second attribute I'm seeing is that they just aren't committing as much yet. So that's why you got only teams of three people, four people. I mean, we're talking about some of the, Germany's economy is holding up the entire European Union, right? I mean, the euro would collapse because of Greece and Portugal and Spain if it weren't for Germany. And it's still an ongoing economic issue and it could, in the global economy, you know, if Germany goes down, like Europe kind of goes down. So, I mean, don't hold, <laughs> don't, don't expect that the Germans are going to kind of rest on, you know, and sit back for too long. I think that what they're, they're going to do is they're going to just try it out, test it out, and then they're going to go a full bore, you know? And so you see why some of the, uh, some of the best products in the world, you know, you got your BMW cars or, you know, you got some of the systems that are German engineering. Uh, they don't fool around. And that's more in the manufacturing space, in the software space. I think they're still, you know, not quite up to speed with us yet. So we got a lead, uh, but, uh, you know, let's not rest on our laurels here, okay? Randy? So you mentioned they're in their infancy. So if, to do an analogy, if let's say they're a, a two or a three year old and we've been at this 10, 10 12 years. Yeah. Is that, is that a fair? I mean, we, we have a big head start on them. Yeah, the United States has a big head start. Uh, I don't, I'll, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I'll tell you, at the OPE conference, which really was object-oriented programming going back 20 years, um, they were thinking about software engineering in that way for a while. And increasingly, when you look at the agenda for the conference topics and the speakers that they're asking, they're asking US speakers who are talking about Agile to go over there, and I think it's going to ramp up more. I'd say I'd give them like two to three years and then look out, you know, because uh, we also had a long head start, but we were in that experimental phase for a lot, you know, a lot of it as all of these practices were coming to being, right? Now they're ready to go, and someone can just grab them lock, stock, and barrel. It was like when the India economy just grabbed SEI level one to five, and wham, they just hit five right out of the gates. I mean, when they started a software lab, they simply implemented all of the five items, right? And got CMM5 certification and grabbed all kinds of work from US companies, even though we created the whole maturity framework. You know, and the way of creating that migration path of, of increasing your, your practices. Now, some people perceive that as well as increasing all the documentation that we had to do. And a lot of places that was true. Um, but uh, when folks said, hey, look at what the Americans created. Let's grab it and use it. I think that's going to happen in Germany and other countries. You know? uh, now that we created it, they're going to grab it. right? Like China making copies of Rolex watches <laughs> or making a better watch. You know, look out, you know, there's a lot of people outside the borders of our 320 million U.S. citizens, you know. There's like a billion and a half people in China writing code. You ever see Shanghai? You know, you see the infrastructure of some of the cities and all of that stuff is all the automation going on there. You, have, you know, look at India, India's economy, right? So uh, we got to keep it up. We got to keep going. Question right there, yes. Do you think uh, uh, there might be a bit of uh, uh, risk aversion that might be uh, causing them to, uh, to adopt the practices more slowly? So the question is, is there a risk aversion that's causing Germany to adopt practices more slowly? The answer, I think, is yes. I mean, they're familiar. They know their refined engineering, predominantly waterfall processes, and they work, right? Yeah, because uncertainty does tend to uh, counter traditional risk management yeah, sure. Like, eh, I don't know if I should do this. We already got something working great. Should, should we kind of like bust it and go and do this full bore? So there's, uh, there's a much more of, a, uh, of a, a risk aversion strategy there. And that happened a lot in the United States too, right? I mean, there's some pretty stodgy inertia going on when we say, hey, we do, it, we do this the way we do it. Well, you know, tell me why, why I should change. And in the beginning, uh, people were slow to change. And even stakeholders, managers who did the funding stuff say, like, show me the data. How can you prove it? You're making all this claim that you're creating working software, early and frequent delivery, and lower bugs. How much lower? And people will go, duh. Like, how much faster? People go, don't know. 
You know? So this is why when at Cutter Consortium, we started getting more inquiries and saying, we want to have you do our Agile transformation, but we want you to help baseline where we are now, do your thing, and then re-baseline us you know, after the transformation and show us whether or not we've actually hit better cycle time, delivering more value with fewer bugs. And that's where we, you know, Jim Highsmith and I said, gosh, we've been like crossfire on the left, on the right, dissing each other. And then we said, we've got to come together. You know? So we, let's take what people track in Agile practices, which waterfall projects didn't. So Agile practices look very closely at size. So if you look at Mike Cohn's books and Succeeding with Agile, and some of the chapters are of my studies and my research work right in the beginning, he then goes on to say, what do Agile teams do fundamentally different? You know, right at the top of the list is estimating size, right? and looking at stories and story points and breaking down stories into smaller pieces and building things and really being very measurement driven. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a freaky thing. The irony of it is Agile outmeasures waterfall. You know, we keep really good information transparent on hand. Whether we do it, we pop it into here, that's the next step, you know. We can, we can easily plot this stuff right up against the trend line. But uh, in the beginning, there was resistance measurement, and yet Agile teams were measuring more, not less. So interesting. Question here. Isn't this great? We got all this time for questions, right? I'm, I'm glad I wasn't so long-winded as I usually can be. Yes? So what have you found from a, so one of the big challenges, obviously, is finding talent. All right, finding talent, yeah. Okay, in, in technology, and what, what have you found, I guess, for Germany and, and other countries as a percentage of college graduates or folks pursuing career paths? What is that percentage, you know, is, is, is Europe or Germany very specifically right. more still oriented towards training their folks in technology, no. software development or not? No. I mean, when I gave a talk in Switzerland, and uh, it was actually about what we're seeing in patterns, and also in Germany, and I said, what's predominant? And predominantly is outsourcing. You know, they, they don't have, they're not farming and raising the talent in software engineering. We weren't either. I don't think we are in the United States. When you look at any college and you see how many science and math majors are, they're like, no, and which is frightening, because my background was in physics, electrical engineering, aerospace, systems engineering. I didn't want to be a banker like my dad on Wall Street, even though back then it was a more honorable profession. You know, Maybe I would have made a lot more money. <laughs> but who needs money? Um, then again, I could have created like eBay or Google or something like that, right? But I didn't. Um, so I, we're seeing that the, the, uh, the challenge is um, uh, finding talent. And the same here, a lot of times we don't have the staff org capability to just get you know, 100 bodies on. I see a lot of companies here still use co firms like CGI or, or Tata, or they have uh, talent that they can tap in a, a different country that's native there. And that inherently is a problem, right? I mean, if you look at um, uh, a typical US company, there are even mandates that say 25% of our labor effort, we want it to be offshore. You know, I mean, that, that kind of like freaky, weird, universal mandates. Like, why? You know, uh, because it's cheaper? Well, how would three times the defects cost you? You know, we did a study for a, a company here in Columbus, won't say who, and we tagged all of their data and we said, okay, how many have greater than 50% offshore component? How many are predominantly co-located pair programmers? And we lit up the green dots and we lit up the red dots, drew a trend line through it, put it on an effort graph and said for this amount of functionality, straight up this axis, the average amount of code stories that you're building, here's the effort hours, it's the QSM industry average, 5,300. Here are the effort hours for your offshore project, 7,900. Here are the effort hours for your co-located paired teams in Columbus, 2,000. So this really freaky thing that we, can, we have to get talent offshore and it has to be cheaper, what if you were using four times the hours to build the functionality? You're not getting them that much cheaper. You're not getting them 25 cents on a dollar, and then you're also getting them at three times the defects. 
and then they're going to rotate the staff because they're going to put them on different accounts and just use them to train. You're going to train them for, so they can be assigned to your competitors' projects. Right? So that happens in the US and that happens in Europe too. The problem with Europe that's interesting is they say we build stuff in English, but here in Germany, English isn't our native language and we're dealing with, say, folks in India where English may not be their native language and we're both trying to communicate in what is not our native original language and we still don't understand each other. So there, there's, a, there's a talent problem. Globally, there's a talent problem. Uh, with universities and math and science not being a focus. I was asked in the state of Massachusetts as a technology, you know, luminary, I guess, you know, to talk at a sixth grade, to talk to sixth graders. There was a whole digital, a digits program where people were going to inspire sixth graders for math and science careers. And they found that if you get to an 11, 12 year old, you know, uh, and you influence their vision about where they might go in life. That's when you can get them to go into math and science. So since January, I've been trying to call the, the school to schedule my visit. They still haven't even put, put me on the calendar yet. And I'm like, wow, it's May. You know, four months have gone by and the math and science teachers haven't called me back for me to go in and give a talk for free. So I think uh, that's going to be a trend. We're still going to see a limit of staffing available in Europe and in the States. And because of that, we got to be even better with the staff that we have. And we got to really kind of grab the best people that we can, maybe poach them from other companies, whatever. You guys probably do that to yourselves all over in this community in Columbus. <laughs> oh, I see some Chase people over there. We used to, gee, weren't you at Nationwide a couple weeks ago? <laughs> Okay, and more? We still got time to hang out and have coffee and talk. There's a guy out there. Now, now, oh, I just noticed that there are people in the upstairs balcony too, so throw a pebble at me or <laughs> M&M if you want to get it. Gentleman in the back row there. Yes, uh, I, I came in late, so I might have missed this, but um, my question is, uh, was there any data collected regarding uh, whether the projects that, took, that participated were working on Greenfield versus existing slash legacy code? I'm thinking in terms of effort and defects. Yeah, well, the question was, uh, uh, did you collect any patterns on whether it's greenfield development or maybe, you know, building something on an existing system or things like that or maintenance? That's the kind of things that we look at for attributes. The answer is yes, all of the above. And the answer is that for the Columbus data, too. So we've got projects that uh, not only are like, say, in a financial services, but also in manufacturing or medical, you know, IT. So there's a mix of different attributes. And you look at these things and you say, okay, what are some of the underlying uh, attributes for this project, which finished in four months and had only 20 bugs? and we were able to pull it off with a team of six people, right? These are the kinds of things that you look for underlying pattern understandings, right? So same thing like if I go to the doctor and I get my annual health physical and she says, here's your cholesterol numbers, you know, here's your blood pressure, here's your that. How do you eat? How do you sleep? Do you exercise? I mean, all of these things make up the ecosystem of my life that results in my numbers being where they are. So when you do this for, you, for real, if you do this for yourself, those are the questions you ask. Um, at uh, Nationwide, where we're doing a lot of analysis like this, they say, how do our web-based projects tend to behave, where it's predominantly Java and .NET and XML? How do our COBOL mainframe projects tend to behave when we're maintaining these legacy systems that really run a heart of our, our, of our of our business, right? How does some of this stuff, you know, that we're building here for mobile apps behave compared to that? And so we'll color code blue, orange, green, and then we'll look at where the constellations light up and different clusters start to pop. And all of these things are pretty easy to read, you know? Say, wow, look at this cluster where we tended to use larger than average teams and our bug rates were this, and it was in this class of work, all right? So this is where the transparency of these release patterns, where it's the interactions between the teams, really starts giving gold, right? Uh, wow, that's why we saved 1.5 million, you know? I and mean, when we're talking about the swing in the numbers on some of these scenarios, we're talking millions, right? We did it this way, we spent a million more, two million more. We do it that way, we spent a million less. The end to end is like two million, you know? And so, these are, these are big bets at the table, 
and in two weeks I'll be giving this talk in Las Vegas. <laughs> you know, what are you going to bet on? What are you going to bet on? So good questions. Inquiring minds want to know. Now you're starting to think like an analyst that can read patterns and charge large fees to senior executives who hire you as a consultant. <laughs> Leave me a business card. We're hiring. <laughs> All right. Uh, still got more time. Any others? Randy? So we had Germany and Columbus. Are there other areas in, let's say, the US that are pockets of stronger agile pieces? And the same kind of question for Germany, or, yeah. or Europe as a whole. Right. Well, Andy's going to Norway for something up there. Are there right. pockets in Europe that are stronger than others? Could be. Could be. Are there pockets in Europe, United States, are stronger than others? Um, I have. Like, let's take the US. I've been talking about this study for a while, and like I go to Boston or I go to Chicago or go to Vegas and wherever these, well, Vegas, people come from all over. Nobody really lives in Vegas. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to come right out and say, at this stage, from what I see, and it could be that I haven't looked at every city, Columbus is like rocking, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's really remarkable when we see that. But can it be sustained? Is this only a piece of the story? Are there other you know, constellations out there still yet to be seen? Probably the answer is yes. That's why I'm really curious about the 2.0 study that we uh, will invite people to, you know, basically it's like timeshare, okay? You don't have to buy the whole house. You basically buy a timeshare of it. We do one study and everyone splits the cost. And then we wind up getting all the research for the benefit of 5, 10, 15 companies. So I think we'll see more in Columbus. Uh, when I shop this idea around other, other cities, I'm not seeing the patterns that are like this. This is right now, you guys are like top dog. I'll come right out and say that, at least from this data. Uh, but that also shouldn't dissuade folks that are saying, gosh, what if I'm not a top dog? Do I really want to look? Oh, well, sure, you know, because that's how you find out what, what to laparoscopically focus on and fix. Europe, I have no idea. Like Norway, because um, this is the first study in, in Europe where we went after Munich, Germany. But Norway, for example, has got five million people. I mean, there are more people in Brooklyn and Staten Island than the entire country in Norway. So maybe they could be good. And I'm starting to see more engineering. Like when I was in Oslo, there were sp uh, engineering uh, firms that were creating open space and you know, uh, co-located environments. But Norway is tiny, you know, so I don't know, I don't know what we're going to be seeing. When I was at Schlumberger and looking at their data, they have a very different kind of application. They're putting code that like are sensors for drill bits that are in ocean rigs, you know, going into North Sea drilling platforms, and that's a whole different kind of code. Um, and remote you know, robotics that are flying under the ocean attached to sensor cables doing geophysical stuff. I mean, that stuff is like nuclear submarine type stuff. So I, I wouldn't say that that pattern is going to tell me anything. But we'll see. I think we're starting to see that more firms want to know, right? It used to be that when I said, hey, we ought to use some, run some metrics, like, nah, we don't want to do that, you know? Then suddenly their agile teams are dismantled and thrown away, and people say, gosh, I wish we did that. You know, we could have made a case to get buy-in and stakeholder commitment for agile if we had some facts behind it, instead of just saying, we think it's good. You know, so, question there? Yep, do you have um, data behind characteristics of, and I don't know a better way of saying it, but agile maturity? <laughs> agile maturity, level one to five. Well, no, no. I, I get that, but I yeah. mean, what characteristics make the most significant difference in the data? What characters make, okay, agile maturity, what characteristics make the most significant? I did a study recently, or b way back, I, I think I showed it here two years ago, where it was agile at five companies, right? And I had two poster children, Follett and BMC Software, and that's in that report, so certainly download it. It's, it's a great short 25 page read versus three others that were less mature, less than two years into it. Uh, Follett and BMC had two or more years into it. Dean Leffingwell was like part of the entire transformation at BMC. Israel Gatt, who now runs Cutter's Agile Practice, was the VP there. Um, and so we looked at the, you know, the two. And for the three that were not the post children, we tended to see more waterfall-y type of behavior. Uh, we tended to see calling it agile, but not doing co-location. They wanted to do sprints. They tended to say, okay, a, a 
four-week sprint could be okay or a six-week sprint, right? They said, oh, we could skip a retrospective, you know, things like that. So when you look at that, we saw teams that were predominantly staffing, more aggressive. Why? Because schedule was important. And when you throw more people on a project to try to compress schedule in the waterfall world, do bugs go down? They go up. They go up. So more of the data, three out of four data points, had higher defects than the industry average. Smells like waterfall to me, you know? Uh, and it was because they were just giving it lip service. Now, when you don't give it lip service and you really say, yeah, we want to co-locate our teams. Yeah, we're going to do pair programming. Yeah, we're going to, you know, uh, have uh, iteration planning and iteration retrospectives. And we're going to do stand-ups. And we're going to do a retrospective at the end. And we're going to take what we learned and we're going to apply it to the next. Those people are just smoking. Uh, the folks, and it's like two to three to one, you know. So when you're talking about bug rates dropping by half and someone else's bug rates doubling, you're talking about a four-fold difference. And that was in one particular company that we measured, what was there before and thereafter. So uh, I think we see things like that with a maturity. Will anyone ever think, let's call an agile maturity scale? I don't think so, you know. Yeah. But, it, but it, certainly, it certainly plays itself out. And I'll tell you, we saw this back in the old waterfall days where people really were doing good CMM practices without all the crap. Uh, they were building systems with, you know, the, again, the faster end of the standard deviation of the statistics and the lower bugs, those were waterfall practices back then. There were people building really good stuff. Really, I mean, look at what we've got here in technology in the States, you know. Uh, we didn't all do that with Agile. I did some good stuff even back in the waterfall days. We got one last question, and I'll let you go out for the break. Sir, did I miss anyone up there? No, people up there are asleep, so <laughs> kidding. Yes? Why Columbus? What is the characteristics about Columbus you think that really... Ben Blancara, why Columbus? I don't know. I, why Columbus? I mean, what's the characteristics that's caused us... You know, I'd ask you guys that. I mean, I could say that as an observation, that there seems to be a vibrancy here. Uh, which surprised me because when I was the first keynote speaker four years ago at this conference five years ago, you know, it was just emergent, right? What's happened in the last three, four, five years that had you guys just grab this sucker and run? I don't know. Maybe it's the water. You know? Maybe because you guys voted Obama in the last election. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, just couldn't resist. The publishing industry also finds something going on here in central Ohio. I don't know. It's cool. With that, I, get, I my you know hats off to you guys. I applaud you. Uh, thank you very much for coming. All right. I'll be around the rest of the day if you want to grab me. And uh, the report uh, you can download uh, qsma.com slash koha. And then this is a description of the Agile 2.0 uh, study if you want to join that. Thanks.